for somebody who's like super new with entrepreneurship and they want to like they have this cool product and they mm-hmm. want to sell in their local coffee shop how mm-hmm. would you literally approach the owner of like give me like your little spiel i remember asking how do you get in touch with this buyer or this broker and everyone's answer was relatively the same. I sent an email, I had, you know, so and so person connect me, and I just realized these people receive so many emails. I need to find a way to be different. I decided that I was going to just start walking into every single place that I wanted to be in and asking to meet whoever was in charge, whether it was a store manager or a buyer, and that was how I started. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Bougie Best Friend Podcast. This is a delicious episode and when I say delicious, I had the pleasure of interviewing the co-founders of Toto Cookies. Toto is an ooey gooey drool worthy delicious good for you cookie made with pure superfood ingredients, powerful adaptogens and zero refined sugar. When I first tried these cookies, I was like there is absolutely no way that these are healthy and they are. <laughs> and I nowadays when I get my Totos that are actually selling nationwide. Now you can get them in every vitamin shop and you can get them in a bunch of stores in LA. When I eat my Totos, I'm just like, I, I feel like I'm doing something good for myself. Okay, but let's let's uh, let's keep this intro short. Sydney started Totos from her kitchen, literally creating cookies on her own for her family. You know what I love? I love to see hardworking people making their dreams come true. And I also love to see people who are open to share their, you know, downfalls and moments that were not so glamorous in the very beginning. And this episode is full of tangible tips you can take, whether you want to improve your diet or you want to start a business or you want to start something with your significant other and learn how to balance the relationship with the business and make sure none of that suffers. At the end of the episode, we have a little giveaway. We're going to be giving away all of these amazing cookies. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, without further ado, let's now hear from Sydney and Bennett. Sydney and Bennett, welcome to Bougie Best Friend Podcast. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be here. I am obsessed with your cookies. And <laughs> Us too. I just, I just have to start with that. Like Toto's cookies, when I tried it for the very first time, I was like, this is, there's no way that this is healthy. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Thank you for yes. making my cookie indulgement guilt free. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I think it definitely was born out of a love for cookies for sure. And that's like always the best feedback when people just can't believe that they're actually good for you. That's what we're going for. We want it to taste as unhealthy as possible, you know, and kind of be like, there is no way. Yeah. And I, my boyfriend is a big sweet tooth kind of guy. And he was like devouring the last box that I got. I actually wanted to do like a taste test and like a video. (laughs) They were all gone in in three days, I swear. But he was like, there's no way. So amazing work. I would love to start with your journey, Sydney. So Mm -hmm. you started the company and then Bennett, how long ago did you join the company? So not that long ago, we started, we started working together on it, uh, mm-hmm. like last year, um, yeah. mm-hmm. last year. And, uh, you know, Sydney will, Sydney will take you through the whole process, but it was kind of a, a birth and then a rebirth. And then, um, here we are today. So it's been, it's been quite a journey to get here. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sydney, let's start with the <laughs> journey. Let me tell me a little bit about you, because I know that you created Totos out of your own need. Like I said, I do love cookies and that is true a hundred percent, but I, Never would have in a million years seen myself working in food and doing something like this. Everything for me really started about 12 years ago now, which is crazy. I'm getting so old now so fast. (laughs) When I was in high school, I grew up a competitive athlete. Originally was thinking that I would be a professional soccer player. That was my thing. And everything was on track for that to happen. I was playing at a really high level. I was playing um, on all kinds of competitive teams, club teams, travel teams. And my sophomore year of high school, one day, everything kind of took a complete 180 turn. I remember it was my best friend's 16th birthday, and I was headed to her birthday, and I was feeling terrible. I just had this terrible stomach ache. I didn't know what was going on. And so pushed my way through it. And and the next day I remember thinking, well, that's weird. Like, I don't know what's going on. Maybe I have the flu. And so I started, you know, I went to the doctor. 
They said I didn't have the flu, kind of ruled it out as a virus, but all of these flu-like symptoms for me didn't go away for a week, and then it was another week, and then a month, and then a few months, and it ended up taking an entire year of these really strange flu-like symptoms that evolved over time to being really intense abdominal pain and chronic fatigue and a ton of weight loss. And I went from being this very active kid to being basically bedridden with absolutely no answers as to what was wrong with me. And so finally, a year later, after every test in the book being done a million times, I was diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease, which in a way was a relief to know what was wrong. But also in that same, you know, appointment after going from a year of being told you're crazy and it's all in your head to, oh, actually we were wrong. You have this disease mm-hmm. that you're now going to live with for the rest of your life. You're never going to play soccer again. You're never going to be active again. And everything essentially, as you know, now is, is different. And so I had a huge identity crisis in high school, had no idea what, would I, what I was going to do. And I ended up going to a junior college. And this is where really like the, I feel like the second half of my life began while I was there after being put on close to 20 types of medication over the course of three years, I met an amazing holistic doctor who introduced me to the world of holistic medicine and holistic health and functional medicine. And That was the first time I had heard from anyone that there was another way. He himself had Crohn's disease and had gone through a really similar healing process of being deep into Western medicine and then, um, you know, finding holistic healing. And so I ended up working with him for about a month and a half, changed every aspect of my life and my diet. And over the course of time, I ended up getting off of all medication and getting in the best shape of my life. And I was so inspired by what was possible and what my body could do when I just gave it the right things. And so I was in amazing health for about a year and a half, transferred into USC as a junior. And my first semester there, all of my Crohn's symptoms started to come back, which I didn't think too much of that can happen. It even happens now to this day if I'm really stressed and overwhelmed. And so I went to the doctor to see what was going on. We did a colonoscopy and I was diagnosed with early stage colon cancer, which I preface all of this with my Crohn's story because one, it's obviously a huge piece of my life still to this day, but also I think my diagnosis with Crohn's and my entire experience with finding an alternative method to heal um, really prepared me for what was to come because I think I was already open-minded to other paths and already really strong internally in knowing that, you know, the doctors are going to do everything they can to help me, but ultimately I am the one that has to be, you know, the fighter for my health. And so the same week I was diagnosed, I was at a wellness convention in downtown LA, and I met this incredible woman there who shared her story with me about how she had lymphatic cancer and how she had healed herself holistically through going plant-based and taking something called adaptogens. Um, And adaptogens, I didn't know what they were at the time. Essentially, they're a class of superfoods that are known to heal stress in the body, They work in each body uniquely, hence their name. And so I was fascinated by her and her story and the idea that there was something else out there that I didn't know about. And so I went totally vegan. I got a ton of adaptogens in the mail. I started taking them every single day for the next three months. That was like the period of time I had between diagnosis and starting treatment or doing any sort of surgery. And I went back to the doctor three months later ran all the same tests on the polyp in my colon, and the results came back that I was completely cancer-free. Wow. I I got goosebumps like three times as you were saying (laughs) this story, honestly. Okay, let's start with, first of all, how did the doctors not, how were they not able to diagnose you for such a long time? So the interesting thing about Crohn's, and if anyone is listening to this and having maybe Crohn's-like symptoms, I would encourage you to definitely get multiple opinions. But 
For Crohn's, your intestines are so long that oftentimes a colonoscopy or an endoscopy where, you know, they go through your throat with a camera, um, they just simply can't see everything that's going on. So I had multiple, multiple colonoscopies, endoscopies, blood tests, ultrasounds, like you name it. Um, but mine is like right in the middle of my gut. So they couldn't see it when they were doing all of these mm-hmm. tests. And so the final test I did was I swallowed a pill with a camera inside of it. And it took pictures all the way down, which then revealed that there was a big problem that we had been missing the whole time. Wow. It's crazy for me. I mean, I know how it is when, you know, you're, you're feeling pain, but they're like, there's nothing wrong with yeah. you. It's all in your head. And it's sometimes it's hard to find a doctor that's actually going to trust you and they're going to mm-hmm. be able to help you. So thank God that they were finally able to give 100%. you that camera pill. <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Okay. 100%. Tell me about ab- adaptogens. Yeah. I ha- don't know anything about them. So you yeah. said they adapt to every single body differently. So they're superfoods. Can you tell me a little bit more about them for somebody who doesn't know anything about it? Like so <laughs> adaptogens, the job of an adaptogen is to promote homeostasis within the body. So for example, there are adaptogens that are really amazing for gut health and specialize in that. There are adaptogens that are amazing for libido and specialize in that. There's adaptogens for, you know, anxiety, being able to rest or energy. Like there, there's, there's a ton of different functions, so to speak. What they do is as you take them, like I said, they will adapt and each body uniquely. They work with your adrenal glands to essentially help balance you to get you to that homeostasis, which is going to be a different point for everyone. The beautiful thing about adaptogens is that you cannot overdose on them. You can definitely take very high doses, but there's no negative side effect beyond maybe being slightly bloated. If you ate a lot of ashwagandha, it doesn't taste really good, but adaptogens, at least the way that I take them now, I typically will cycle them. So if I know I'm going into a period of like really high stress, ashwagandha is amazing for that. So I will take that more regularly than taking something like lion's mane, which is an adaptogenic mushroom that's really amazing for focus. And you can mix these different things together. Can you name drop a few other adaptogens? Because as you just said, ashwagandha and lion's mane, I'm like, yeah, I actually heard about that. So I actually do know what it is, but I just didn't know it's the same thing. Ashwagandha is an adaptogen, lion's mane, reishi, maca, turkey tail, chaga, rhodiola rosea. There's, I would say there's probably 30 to 40 pretty well-known adaptogens. Matcha is another one. And they have to be able to promote homeostasis and also be non-toxic in the body in order to be considered an adaptogen. So basically you cured yourself with adaptogens and your colon cancer, you were cancer free. I am cancer how did free. that happen? Do you, how can I mean? Thank God, I'm I'm so happy for you. And <laughs> I'm I'm just I don't know. I'm I'm getting so emotional right now, and I'm just so happy that you were able to cure yourself. Tell Thank us you. the process. Like, how did you yeah. do that? Did you do your own research? Walk us through the process. After learning about them for the first time, I mean, it really sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole. And my biggest question through the process was. If these things are legit and they work, why did it take me getting sick to find out about them? Why is this not recommended by my doctors? Why is this not, you know, as common as taking a vitamin C every morning, which I did for, you know, my entire childhood? (laughs) You know, they've got Flintstones gummies everywhere. Like, why isn't it as easy as that? (laughs) And so that was my biggest question. And so I did a lot of like, hardcore medical research, you know, like going on PubMed and like looking at actual articles and actual research that's been done on these various adaptogens. And essentially, conclusively, the long and short of what I found was that, yes, these things do work. They've been used for thousands of years, specifically in Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. They are very, very common. I would say, you know, as common as it is to take an Advil when you have a cold or you have a headache, like it's just integrated into the culture and to how they know to heal themselves. And so there are certain adaptogens that are even used in our modern medicine here in the Western world now, but they're mixed with various types of chemicals, et cetera, to be able to patent it and then make it something that they can sell at mass. 
And I think my biggest finding through that process was, fortunately uh, and unfortunately, Western medicine, it, it's amazing in so many ways, but they profit and stay in business by keeping people on medication. As someone who now works in food, it's a very you know intertwined process. The chemicals in our food make us sick, and then the medicine is supposed to heal us, but it doesn't actually make us better. It just kind of perpetuates this whole process. The reason why adaptogens aren't as popular or haven't been as popular here is because it's not a very profitable business for a lot of people to be really healthy and take care of themselves. And so I knew from doing research on adaptogens that there wasn't any negative, you know, side effect to giving it a shot. And so I ordered about 10 different kinds. I ordered reishi and turkey tail and ashwagandha and maca and a lot of those ones that I just named. Turkey tail and reishi in particular are amazing for gut health. Turkey tail in particular has such incredible anti-cancer properties. So that was one I kind of always focused on and still do. I was taking them every day and every single thing I ate and drank. And they come in like a powder or like a liquid or... Yeah, they come in both. Um, you can get mm -hmm. them in a powder form or in like a tincture form. I was doing a powder form at the time, but I've done both. I think the most important thing is where they're sourced from. And where should where should they be sourced from for somebody who wants to? For someone who is looking for adaptogens, typically most of them are not indigenous to China, but there are a lot of suppliers that will pull adaptogens from China. So each adaptogen is different. Maca, for example, comes from Peru. Chaga comes from up in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States. So it's kind of different, but I think doing a little bit of research to know where they're actually native to makes a really big difference. So it does take a little bit of work, but it goes a really long way for sure. I was totally vegan during that time. And I will say there was other changes that I made too. Like I started meditating. I started to move my body a bit more. It was really a very like holistic process. I can't say it was any one thing, but I know that the adaptogens, my diet were a very big thing. And same thing with my Crohn's. I mean, I'm still off of medication to this day, 12 years later, and I credit that to my diet and, and really taking the time to, to care for my body. Amazing. I <laughs> love that so much. Okay. So then you decided to start Toto's with all these superfoods, or how did the idea of this brand even came about? So after my experience healing, I wanted to find a way to share adaptogens with the masses so that someone wouldn't have to be in the position like I was in, you know, like looking for them. And it started with my family. My family is not exactly the adaptogen or superfood seeking type. And so I wanted to get them on the adaptogen bandwagon. And when I realized They just simply weren't going to do it unless I watched them <laughs> choke down these disgusting smoothies I was making. I realized that it, you know, it was going to be pretty hard to make that new habit stick. And so one night we were eating dinner and every night after dinner, we would make Toll House cookies. That was like our thing. And I had this idea that if I could somehow hide these adaptogens in the Toll House cookies we were eating every single night without fail, no matter what then I wouldn't need to like incentivize them to do it. They could just enjoy something that they love and I would know all of the benefits it was having for them. And so that was initially where the idea started. I wanted to remake, you know, our absolute favorite dessert with all of these amazing superfoods that I was eating on my journey, like ton of almonds and almond butter and oats and flax and all of this amazing stuff That is really amazing for the gut and inflammation and so many other things. And then infuse it with these adaptogens so that they could get all of these other beautiful added benefits as well. So were you secretly putting adaptogens in their food or you were like, okay, I'll tell you like, this is, <laughs> you know, you're, you're I, eating something healthier than you expected. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't actually spike our whole house cookies because I couldn't figure out quite how to do it effectively at first, but that was the initial <laughs> idea that I wasn't poisoning my family <laughs> with healthy <laughs> adaptogens. Yeah, from there, it it was a, a very long and tedious recipe testing process. I was not a baker. I was a junior senior at USC studying marketing with no background really in food, but 
I was so determined. And so every single day before and after school, I was living at home. I would just be in the kitchen trying every combination under the sun of different things. And it started where I would have my friends come over on the weekend. We would do a big taste test of all the things I had made. And about every single weekend for a year straight, everyone was just so sure that it would never work. I mean, I just looked at my friends' faces, watching them attempt to eat the things that I had made and just, you know, see that there was just no shot that that it would ever work. But um, about a year later. It was not, it didn't taste the way. Oh, they Uh were terrible. Yeah. And and the other Mm -hmm. thing is that she was trying to do this in a way that's already really tough to bake, right? Like baking gluten-free vegan products on like just alone is tough. I mean, there's not a lot of vegan and gluten-free products out there that are like, oh my gosh, this is delicious and Mm -hmm. tastes just like the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it was the combination of how do you blend in adaptogens? How do you hit all these different benchmarks with protein and and making them vegan and gluten-free and all these things that Sydney really wanted the product to be? Yeah, you had a lot of like healthy factors that you had to kind of put in and then make it taste amazing. (laughs) I could make a, you know, a normally good tasting cookie, but to do it with the ingredients I wanted to use and, you know, all of the benefits I wanted it to have was a, it was a real challenge. But about a year later, I landed on the first recipes that would finally become Toto. Okay, where did a name come from, first of all? So the name, uh, it is not, we know that it shares the name with, uh, you know, Dorothy's dog. We also share a name with a toilet. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) Toto means whole or complete in Latin. And we wanted something that would embody that feeling whole, complete, being whole and complete. Yes. It just so happens that we share the name. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't even, when you were like Dorothy, I'm like, oh, is that the Wizard of Oz? Yes. Okay. I love the name because it's, I mean, my nickname is Coco. So Coco Toto, like, yeah, yeah we're the to same. Be. To be. Easy to remember, you know, simply easy to remember. <laughs> so when I'm talking to brand founders, I always love to hear the story of, okay, like, did you build the name? Did you build the, did you create the recipe first or you created the name first? You created uh-huh. the marketing strategy, you created uh-huh. the branding. So what came first? The recipe definitely came first. Toto, before it was called Toto, was called Made By And at that time, it was just me, a one woman show making cookies out of my apartment and delivering. I love those videos, by the way. (laughs) I need to tell you that I love those videos. And I love that you're like showing videos from way before when you were doing it in your kitchen. And then when you guys did it, like, I don't know, overnight, that was an (laughs) insane story. We're going to get to that. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it started super small. It was just me and my kitchen for about a year. Then I hired a a small team and we were in a commercial kitchen. And I would say I didn't really have a marketing strategy at first. It was really just the strategy was my story and and my journey. Mm -hmm. And I think that I took it slow in the beginning and learned so much. And I'm so glad that I did because I had a lot of mistakes to make up front. And I think that I learned so much from those first, you know, that first year or so doing it by myself. So many lessons that I've now taken with me into this next phase. And Toto became Toto. And we were about a year in when Bennett and I started working on it together. Um, and I would say we knew we had all of the pieces there. You know, we had this amazing product. We had this great story. We had, you know, a great brand, but it, it needed to be like really sifted and pulled together. Um, and like Bennett said earlier, re, rebirthed. Yeah. It's, um, it's something I think that a lot of, founders run into. And I think it's, you have to go through these lessons, Mm. right? Like you just, you have to go through the lessons of taking this thing that you love out into the world and hoping that other people will love it too. And hoping that you can trust other people with this thing that you've spent so much time and energy on. And, um, the reality is like, there's a lot of people that, that take advantage of that. And I think one of like the first thing I, I did coming into this and we, we were already dating at the time. So it wasn't even an intention to be working together. I think we almost drew a line of like, we probably shouldn't be working Mm -hmm. together, but I had been building and running early stage startups for about six years before that. I dropped out of school building a startup studio and through that process have co-founded a variety of different early stage companies. And I think once I started to see like not only the potential of everything that 
Sydney had with Toto, but also the areas of opportunity, the people that were were trying to take advantage of the brand, the ways that things weren't set up correctly that could become big issues Mm -hmm. later on. It almost became this like labor of love together (laughs) to like have to dive into this process of doing everything I can to, to kind of, you know, shape Toto for, for a successful future as well. And then, you know, bit by bit, we got deeper and deeper into that process. And by the end of it, we pretty much rebuilt everything from the ground up, everything from the, the brand to the, (laughs) to the product, to the team, to the manufacturer, to the distributors, to the, to the lawyers and the accountants. We pretty much just kind of like overhauled everything in an effort to kind of like take the core of Toto and the incredible product and the story and the mission and kind of everything that Sydney was so good at and then just fortify it with all of these other pieces that are really required to go from, you know, a a brand that has a really strong cult following to something that can scale nationwide. What is your background, Ben? And you mentioned that you dropped out of school and that you were building startups. Tell me a little bit more. Like, where did that come from, your entrepreneurial spirit? I've wanted to be building things since I was really young. I mean, I, I started my first company in like high school. Like I started, I see that that was when I first dove into it. And then I had a pretty untraditional path. I did a, um, a gap year with a, uh, with a group called global citizen year and spent a year in Ecuador before going to college and, um, going into college had a very different approach. My, my idea going into college was I don't want to graduate and have to go find a job. I Hmm. want to try to build something through the process so that I'm, you know, already rocking and rolling and kind of seeing those four years, not as, a prequel to my life, but like extra time that I could use to launch myself into what I wanted to be doing. And it just happened to be that, you know, I met, I met a a group of people that, you know, we had a lot of synergy and, and I kind of dove headfirst into that and left school and, you know, co-founded this business, which went on to in some way, either co-found or work on about a hundred startups over the course of six years. We, we ran a whole marketing and creative agency and then simultaneously we co-founded brands with founders. And so I kind of saw both sides of the table and for six years was balancing, you know, plate after plate after plate with, uh, trying to work with early stage founders from the ground up, kind of doing some of what I've done with Toto, which is working with a founder who has an incredible passion for something, who has a really strong skill set, but needs a lot of support with other aspects of the business to, to kind of help it become successful. And so that the, the, the model is called a startup studio model um, that we were doing. And we were pretty early to the game. I mean, we were we were doing it as, as you know, young kids with not a lot of experience. And so, so much of it was trial and error, to be completely honest. And I like to say I put myself through like the gnarliest hmm. six-year startup education course possible. Came out the How other- do I join that course? Because I need it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 it makes it easier to be like a kid with no, you know, yeah. no, nothing, no, 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 real, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no real risk, you know. And that's what I always say to young founders is like, you'll never have another time in your life where mm. there's like – there's really no risk for the most part. Like you're not going to fall very far, right? You're not, it's not, it's not a far fall. And the, and the deeper you get into life, the more responsibility you have, if you start to have, you know, a family or, or a serious relationship, you know, it just becomes harder to take risks like that. So I think it was really a testament to the time we were in and putting ourselves in an environment to be able to fail safely to some mm-hmm. extent. I would love to speak more on failure because I feel like today everybody's glorifying entrepreneurship before it was becoming a lawyer or a doctor mm-hmm. or movie star. Now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. until they see what it takes. And myself, I, you know, I moved here when I was 22 on my own from Croatia. My whole family's back there. And when I was, when I told them that's my idea and I wanted to come here and they were like, what are you going to do in America? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. Like I always said this, like, I'm going to figure it out no matter what. They didn't understand that. And I feel like a lot of people today don't understand how tough It actually is to be on your own, to start a company on your own and to face all these failures. And you don't have a support system that, you know, you don't have a team of people in the very beginning who are going to be like cheering you on and supporting you. So I love that you shared that you were going through obviously some difficulties. And can you give us some specific examples and how did you solve them? Hmm. Oh, man. I mean, I've (laughs) I've been through just about every startup failure <laughs> or issue you can possibly imagine. You know, love like, that. Love I, that. I, I, <laughs> I can totally relate to that, even though I didn't have an actual company, but like doing everything like social media stuff on my own, it's like yeah. an animal. Yeah. We, we never even raised a lot of money for, for the startup studio. I mean, we ran 
a startup studio, which is already a very complex model, only having ever, ever raised like a quarter million dollars over the entire course of six years. So we ran pretty much off of revenue. So it was always really tight. And I mean, I had months where I was living on my co-founder's parents' couch, um, mm-hmm. where we literally were like, what are we going to do for fun? Because we have no money to Zero spend. dollars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've had moments where when we were, we were trying to land we, we part of the business did some work in crypto and, and I was out in Asia trying to land a client for our company. And I remember we were trying to win over this client for this really massive consulting agreement, which was going to be so much bigger than anything we'd worked on that we felt like was going to really launch us to the next stage. And uh, one night they were like, we're going to go to a poker night, you know, just just come to this poker night. And we're like, okay. And we go to this poker night and they're like, yeah, the minimum, the, the low table buy in is $200, the higher table buy in is $500. And I remember going to a bank to pull out cash because I was like, I have to kind of play the game and try to get this client closed. And I pulled out $200 out of my checking account, which had $300 in it and lost it all within an hour playing poker with like literally ex pro players. But it was just like that moment of like, okay, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm right on the edge, you know, but I think like, I, I love that as well. Like I wanted to go through that. I think, think looking back at it, like, I really did want to go through those trials and tribulations, but, but I've dealt with, you know, really low cash. I've dealt with investors that have told us they're going to invest and then bailed last minute. I've dealt with co-founder disagreement and removal. It's been, you know, just about everything you could imagine as far as kind of failures and Mm -hmm. struggles. Yeah. You mentioned co-founder disagreements. So you guys are co-founders at this point and in a relationship. (laughs) Yet. (laughs) (laughs) Hasn't removed me yet. What's the dynamic? Do you have similar jobs? Do you do one thing? You do the other thing? Like, tell me about your systems today. Yeah, I think we balance each other pretty well. Bennett is so good at so many things that uh, I don't absolutely love. And I think that having someone to kind of fill in my gap, so to speak, really allows me to shine in the things that I know that I love and that I'm great at. Um, and so I think it's been a really natural balance, but also Bennett is super outgoing. And like also now, you know, with stuff like this, we're really excited to like both become the face of the brand together. But I think that, I mean, when I first met him, before yeah how did you meet let's let me hear the love story (laughs) first of all (laughs) oh man I I always love telling the story of how Bennett and I met um and kind of like how we came to be because I think it's it was unlike any other relationship I've ever had I think in the past for me when I've like gotten into a serious relationship it's been pretty obvious from the beginning from both sides that like that's what we're pursuing. But this was actually completely different. I met Bennett, gosh, I think it was two years ago. Now we were both in different relationships and we met at a, it was like a a fundraiser for a startup. And I remember walking into this event and we started talking and (laughs) he just started talking about startups. And I remember being so turned off by it. I was so (laughs) tired that day. The last thing I wanted to do was talk about what I did for work. And I just remember walking away from the conversation like, wow, this guy's very intense. (laughs) And uh, that was our first meeting. But, you know, I knew he was cute, kind of like didn't really think too much of it. And then about a year later, I mean, maybe not quite a full year, I was at a coffee shop one day in in Venice where I lived at the time and I saw him and I couldn't remember his name, but I saw him right up on his bike. So I said, hi. Um, and And you were like, Oh, you were that annoying guy from the start. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's who you are. He said, hi, and hugged him back. Also couldn't remember where he knew me from. (laughs) So we're just two kind of strangers hugging each other in front of a coffee shop. (laughs) And uh, I remember I was there for a meeting. So I'm like having my meeting and Bennett goes inside to have a coffee. And sorry, that was Venice in... Uh, Venice in California. Not in Italy. Okay. Yeah. Oh <laughs> man, I wish. Place. That would have been way better that though. That would be, would yeah, be that would very be. nice if it was though. <laughs> and so as Bennett's sitting inside, he messaged me on Instagram and asked if I wanted to go for a sunset walk after after coffee, after I was done with my meeting. And I think I originally said yes, but then I eventually said no. And I kind of went on my merry way 
And we had tried to, you know, go on a date for a few weeks, didn't end up happening. And uh, one night he came out with me and my friends. And I think it, it started that night, but it was really fully the next day when we got together and we had coffee. We spent the whole day together, um, like from afternoon to night, got dinner and had just the most amazing conversation. And I, I think I felt like I knew when we were in Intelligentsia, that was the coffee shop. I just had this moment where I didn't know, you know, exactly what was going to happen from there. But I just knew that I, I don't even want to say want, like I really felt like I needed him in my life in some capacity, whether it was going to be romantic or as a friend or what. I just, it was almost like a deep knowing that's really hard to describe. I had never felt anything quite like it before. And so we kind of started dating, but not really. Then Bennett wasn't into it anymore. (laughs) And it was kind of like this hot and cold thing for a little bit. Um, And eventually, I'd say about a, I don't know, a couple weeks later, wasn't too long of a wait, um, (laughs) we decided that we were, you know, going to actually give it a shot. To be honest, I think throughout our entire relationship, even before anything was official, the thing that I would credit how incredible and like deep and passionate and loving and safe I feel like our relationship is, is our ability to communicate openly about everything, even when it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it really like the beginning, I think for me as well, like it was it was a shock to my system seeing something that didn't match my past patterns, you know? And I think we get, we, we kind of think we know what we want and we think we know what we're looking for. And I think we look at this list that we have in our mind of like, this is what my partner is like, and this is how they act and this is what they do. And, but the reality I think is like, you start to just very quickly go off of what you've had in the past and what you've been attracted to in the past. And I think it took a bit of time to realize that this isn't what I've had in the past. This isn't, you know, where I've been, but this is like really where I want to be. And this is, this is who I want to be with. But I, you know, I, I completely credit Sydney with having the patience of, with me through that process of kind of coming to that realization. Cause I think I, you know, I could have missed it um, because it, you know, it was so much healthier and <laughs> I think more positive and supportive and just collaborative than any relationship I'd been in. And, and I think the ability to communicate was something I'd never experienced. I think I'd always kind of tried to hide to some extent my thoughts and feelings from people out of a fear of kind of hurting them or saying something that was going to offend them or or whatever. And I think like we just set a tone immediately of like complete open honesty about however we're feeling. If we're feeling like I'm not sure if I can do this because I'm not sure if I'm ready to just be with one person or whatever it is that the conversation Mm -hmm. you feel like it's going to be triggering in some way. Like we just kind of like flex that muscle in the beginning. And it's been something we've kept up. And I think it's probably the only reason that we could do this. I mean, Mm -hmm. my desk is literally about five feet that way, five feet this way. (laughs) So we spend 23 hours a day, like within arm's reach of each other. Um, and I think if we didn't have just an insane level of open communication and the ability to talk about kind of anything as it comes up Mm -hmm. without judgment, like I, there's, there's no way we could be doing this right now. I wish that my boyfriend is here right now uh, as a part of this conversation because we have very, like, very, not not a similar story, like the Venice stuff Mm -hmm. and all that. But, (laughs) Ben, what you mentioned about, like, thinking that you want some kind of person and then end up wanting something totally different. Like, my boyfriend is really private. He has, like, 12 posts on Instagram. And, Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys, we follow each other on social media. So you kind of see that that's the complete opposite of yeah. what I am. Yeah. And like when we started kind of seeing each other dating, whatever, he was like, oh, I'm never gonna, that's what he thought. He's like, oh, this is not going to be serious. This is, you know, this is like some kind of influencer, whatever. Yeah. We're never going to be together. And I also had all these lists in my head. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is, this is just going to be for fun. But then literally life gives you what you need instead yeah. of what you want. And also as we have these lists in our minds, it's like, where did that get you this far? Like you mm-hmm. obviously, if you're still looking for someone, obviously these lists don't really work. So maybe mm-hmm. try to rethink your list. So I really love mm-hmm. what you said. Uh, Sydney, you mentioned that you guys kind of complement each other in the mm-hmm. business side of things. What do, what would you say is your role and what is Bennett's role? Yeah, I would say my role is definitely very brand focused, very community building focused. Um, like 
long term vision focus, product focus, formulation <laughs> focus. Um, and Bennett is absolutely incredible. He is one of the most, if not the most detail oriented person I've met in my entire life. And I am the opposite of that, which makes him really amazing at things like legal work, finance, logistics, operations. He's also incredibly creative though. So now that, you know, we're on this together, I think that we really enjoy doing a lot of like the vision building and like future planning, you yeah. know, together, both for the business and and in life. So, yeah, it's been really great to be able to have that balance to know that I can really pour my full self into, you know, really connecting with our community and focusing on how we can share our mission in a bigger and more impactful way while knowing like I'm fully supported in that so we can both do that successfully. How do you handle those moments when you don't agree on something? Hmm. Hmm. Bennett, I'll give you the mic. <laughs> um, I, I feel like one thing that Sydney is really good about, because I'm not good about this, <laughs> is being able to remove any sense of ego from disagreements and not letting things spiral into like emotion as much as kind of just being like, okay, I get that. Now what? Right. Cause I'll, so much of my job, I mean, one of the challenges of like <laughs> the beginning phase was like my job in the beginning was kind of to come in and find all of the things that she'd done wrong. Right. <laughs> like to some extent I was kind of having to go through all these areas of the company and be like, okay, here's a pitfall. Here's an issue. What was this money spent on? Like all these things that kind of, I had to kind of just do to make sure we were ready for the next phase. And so it kind of put us straight into the fire right away. I mean, we literally had to go into just kind of like deep insecurities around this is her baby and this is something that she's put so much time into, but you know, here, here, here are the things right in your face of that, that could have been things that killed the company because that's the thing with startups is like, no matter how good it seems like it's going, there's always about 10 things in the background that could, <laughs> could take you down. And I think, um, just through my experience, I was a little more keyed into that, you know, just, just having gone through it before. I think we're pretty good with disagreement on stuff. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't really, stay mad at each other for very long. I think we kind of are pretty good at delegating to each other's strength of like, mm -hmm. if this is something that I have a bit more experience with, like making me, letting me kind of make the final call on it. And if it's something that Sydney is better on, you know, having her do the same, um, I think we're pretty good with that and pretty respectful of what the other person's strengths are. Yeah. I think that because it's, you know, because we spend so much time together we don't really have time to like not get along um <laughs> mm -hmm. so i think that it's kind of been i don't even know if it's so much been conscious you know as as it has been like me just knowing that like i want i know that each of us deserves to show up as our best selves for ourselves for toto and also for the life that we're building and so i feel like kind of touching on what I said earlier about just having honest, open communication. If there's something that we don't agree on, which I really can't say happens too often, but when it does, I think that I always approach things from a situation or a mindset that whatever the problem is, like it's me and him versus the yeah. problem. It's not me versus you. And so mm -hmm. I'm always really keyed in to listening as best as I possibly can and actually making change around something if it does require that I do something differently because I think that's like the best way that you can show your partner that you really hear them is not just to say that you hear them but then actually show them that you do no I love that uh, when it comes to starting a company I feel like a lot of people don't understand the financial side of things mm -hmm. and like raising money or putting your own money can you speak more on that when it comes to Toto what did you guys do I know you have some investors right yeah. now but how did yeah. you start the business when I first started I started in the most irresponsible way uh, so similarly to what Bennett said I started it you know when I was younger when I started made by and I felt like I didn't necessarily have a lot to lose and and so I really just started with my own money, which was not very much at all. I started a, a pre-sale online for our website to generate the first, you know, orders. And that money was the money I used to buy the first round of ingredients for all the cookies that I shipped out. And then slowly but surely over time, as we got into 
one coffee shop and then another and then air one. And then we slowly, slowly scaled. Then it became obvious that in order to do this, you know, at a larger scale, we were going to need to bring on investors and help. And so I raised a family and friends round first, just really people that I knew that were, you know, either people that I knew directly or friends of friends that are in the industry. And now this round that we just raised for Toto is, I'd say, a bit more official and established that the people that we're bringing in have really, really incredible impressive backgrounds and we're surrounding ourselves with the most strategic people we possibly can really trying to focus on having like a beacon in every piece of the business and you know someone who's amazing with operations someone who's like the best of the best with finance someone who's amazing with brand and marketing and and so I think that we've definitely approached it you know as the business has grown in a different way but I think that that's kind of a natural arc, you know, like when you're first getting started, I didn't know anyone in this space. And so I started with, with what I had. Yeah. And and I think one thing for people who do want to dive into this, that I honestly learned from Sydney because I'd done it very differently with my past companies is it's really hard to want to go raise small checks. (laughs) Like it takes a lot of time and energy to close money. And Mm -hmm. One thing that Sydney did, and I honestly, it's changed my perspective of how I look at fundraising, especially for new entrepreneurs. Like it's okay to go raise small checks, like $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, you know, like it's okay to go out and have to put together 30 people to raise Mm -hmm. $200,000, you know, like that's okay. And and I honestly think that sometimes you have to, because it's hard to find people who are going to write bigger checks, especially in the beginning. It's Mm -hmm. easier to find people who believe in you. Right. And I think like Sydney found a lot of investors in the beginning who, yeah, they liked the product. It tasted really good and they believed in the vision, but honestly they believed in Sydney and, and investors, you know, at this stage, even up till where we are right now, which is raising a seed, they're still investing in the founder. And so going and finding brand advocates that are putting in a little bit of money now have buy-in and that you can rely on in the future mm-hmm. as people to support the brand um, is a really smart strategy in the beginning. And then of course you, you, you kind of turn over a leaf and you're able to start raising the larger checks from, from VCs or, or angels. But we've really tried to stick to this methodology of finding people that are strong brand advocates Mm -hmm. that really care about what we're doing, that are passionate about what we're doing. If they're VCs, they're like non-traditional VCs that are really just kind of more friends first and happen to have a VC fund and trusting the people that are, that are, that are putting in money and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. setting the expectation that this is a family. Everyone needs to chip in when we launch a new product all the investors need to go leave reviews and they need to go buy it and leave reviews, right? Like just yeah. kind of keeping, yeah. keeping this momentum of like doing, doing all the small things to make people feel bought in. And mm-hmm. we've had some really incredible investors that haven't put in a ton of money that have really showed up in massive, massive ways. Yeah. Um, and so you don't really know whether the person who puts in $10,000 or half a million dollars is going to be more valuable at the end of the day. You know, I love what you said that Sydney taught you certain things when it comes to raising money, because I really do wish my boyfriend is uh, on this conversation. He's an (laughs) entrepreneur and he also has a business and I know everything about the entrepreneurial journey, raising Mm -hmm. money from that person, that investor, like we live in the same apartment, we work from the same apartment. So we're very similar when it comes to you two. And I think something that I also taught him what you guys also experience is like, you don't have to start a business with like a million dollars in your bank account. Like, yeah, that would be nice, but it's not always necessary. You have to Mm -hmm. figure out different ways how to start a business. And then sometimes when you do have all this massive investors and you think that you have all this money and you start burning through that money and then you're like, yo, I can't even pay my, not even pay myself. I can't even buy uh, ice cream. So it's like, you have to think about that. And learning how to run a business with a super lean budget. And like, you know, don't get me wrong. Like all my past companies, we we raised very lean budgets in the beginning. I mean, we, we launched most of them very bootstrapped. So it wasn't that we'd raised a ton of money in the past. And honestly, my experience had been with how do you stretch, you know, $100,000 to cover a team for, you know, a year, mm-hmm. right? Like if you need to by, by supplementing revenue and finding creative ways to cut costs. But I think the difference being you have to have both. You have to have the really strong ability to manage money. But you have to have the really strong dedication to go do what it takes to have conversation after conversation after conversation, which always like as a super like 
optimization focused person, mm-hmm. like that feels like such a time burn to me. Like yeah. spending all this time to raise $5,000 to me is like, how much time is it actually worth? Yeah. You know? But I think like you need to like something that I needed to learn was having the dedication to go raise the smaller checks. And then I think something that I've helped to teach Sydney a lot is like, once you have those checks, how do you stay mm-hmm. super, super diligent with making sure that you don't need to go raise money again in the next, you know, six to 12 months? 100%. So Sydney, you mentioned that you started uh, selling in like coffee shops, then you Mm -hmm. got to Air One, and now you guys are nationwide in vitamin shop. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, Yeah, we're nationwide in vitamin shop and soon to be Sprouts. And we're we're launching in about, I mean, I, I think between a few other retailers, we have like 300 to 400 more doors within the next like couple months. So yes, it's been, it's been wild to watch it go from, you know, just four or five Air One locations to uh, thousands. How did that even the very beginning for somebody who's like super new in the business, yeah. like super new with entrepreneurship and they want to like, they have this cool product and mm-hmm. they want to sell in their local coffee shop. How mm-hmm. would you literally approach the owner of like, give me like your uh, little spiel? I love this question because <laughs> this was my life for so long. I mean, it, this was my, my day to day was figuring out how do I do that and how do I stand out? And I remember going to my very first Expo West, um, which is a big food convention. This was was right when I was starting Made By. And I remember asking that exact question to so many different food and beverage founders. How do you get in touch with this buyer or this broker? How did you guys get into XYZ? And almost every single person told me, you know, I sent them an email or, and, and everyone's answer was relatively the same. I sent an email, I had, you know, so and so person connect me. And I just realized, They are, these people that I'm trying to get in touch with receive so many emails. Like, you know, I I don't think that mine is going to stick out in the bunch. So I need to find a way to be different. So I decided that I was going to just start walking into every single place that I wanted to be in and asking to meet whoever was in charge, whether it was a store manager or a buyer. And that was how I started. I walked into a uh, Love Coffee, which is a coffee shop in Santa Monica. And I asked to meet the manager. I told them I had this cookie company. They said to bring in samples. So I did the next day. And then they were just, they loved them. And they were like, yeah, let's place our first order. Can you deliver tomorrow? And I did that process over and over and over and over. And when I landed, I actually landed Intelligentsia Coffee, which is the same <laughs> coffee shop. Oh, that's your spot. That no, oh, that's so yeah. cute. That was my one of my very first locations. Um, it was it was a process, and to be honest, I don't think anyone had any idea in the beginning that it was just me doing this from my kitchen. And so, you know, they they would assume that I had a team dropping off cookies in the morning, and it was always me doing absolutely everything. So I would say my biggest piece of advice is like, get out there because especially in the world now that we live in where so many things are virtual, there is absolutely nothing that compares to human connection. When like, I still know every single buyer manager that I've ever met. Um, And when you establish that relationship, especially if you're selling a product that goes such a long way, more than ad dollars and promo dollars yeah. ever will, because then then they know you, then you're their friend, then they care. And I think that's a big piece of what having Bennett has allowed both of us to do. Now that you know we kind of have the workload shared a little bit, we can focus on maintaining those relationships because when you win someone over, it's not just your their your product that they're buying they're buying they're buying a piece of you yeah and that's it's such a smarter way to go about the beginning too and like one of the the biggest lesson from running a startup studio for six years is the biggest thing people always skip they always skip the product the market validation whether Mm -hmm. like they always skip it and whether you think you did it or not like did you actually do it? And and the only way to really do it is will people pay for this product that mm-hmm. are not that don't know me, right? That's the only way to know. Mm-hmm. If I go into a store, and so I think like people spend all this time building brands and pitch decks and trying to raise money and all this stuff before they've just like 
created the simplest, most straightforward, most basic version of what they're trying to create and trying to get some people to pay for it. And if you're building a piece of software and it does all these things for somebody, like manually do it on the back back end and go try to sell the service to somebody just to see if people even care. And I think like through Sydney doing that process, she proved that there was a strong market for a a strong market desire for the product. And then from there, you know, it's easy to go to the next store when you say, look, it's already in X coffee shop and we're selling this many cookies a month. Right. Cause it's like, okay, at least there's Mm -hmm. some validation of, of the demand. It's also not that hard to, I mean, it's just, it's more of a mental thing than anything to walk in and try to just sell Mm -hmm. something. Right. But you'll save yourself so much heartache because if you go out and raise money and bring on a team Mm -hmm. and and, and create all these complexities for yourself before you even know whether people are going to pay for it, like you're just going to make your life way harder than it needs to be. I have so many questions for you guys, but I know we're already like (laughs) almost at an hour mark. So I'm going to try to keep it short. Question when it comes to raising money and starting a business, we all hear so many no's. What is keeping you, you know, engaged and going? And I don't want to hear like your typical, you know, I believe in myself. I believe in the product. I like give me something deeper than that. When you hear 10 no's and maybe you're having a horrible day, you're in the worst mood and you just, this huge investor was supposed to give you this much money and they just like bail last minute. They're, you know, making all these excuses. Like how do you Get yourself out of that. I think the biggest thing for me has been the why is so much deeper than the company. And I think mm-hmm. as a young entrepreneur, it's really easy. And I did this for years for your like goal to be, I'm going to finish this company. I'm going to build it. And I'm going to sell it. And then what that gets me is an open door to choose what I want to do next. Right. But that goal is like really not a long-term goal, right? Like it feels like a long-term goal because you're saying, oh, it's going to set me up for, you know, being able to do something later, but it's not really concrete, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't really know what you're going towards. You just know you're going towards being able to choose again, right? And that's always what I had. I mean, it was like, you know, let's do this so we can get the financial freedom so that we can do fill in the blank, right? And I think the biggest change with doing this with a partner has been, it's about setting a foundation for our lives. It's about setting a foundation for our future, for, you know, our future family, for, you know, everything that comes next. And so the the goal shifts from a five-year goal to a 30-year goal to mm-hmm. a 40-year goal, because this becomes a foundation on which we can build a life together for ourselves and our family. And I think that motivation is something that's deeper than I've ever experienced before as a founder. And especially as a young man, I think that's like, it's been a very humbling experience to, to realize that my goals are so much greater than myself. And I think that that helps a lot to get through stuff that would have been easy to just want to, want to quit on before. Yeah. That was so beautiful. (laughs) I was going to say the same. You, you stole my answer. (laughs) So I completely agree. It does. I, if you would have asked me this question, you know, before Bennett and I met, I would have told you that I, I started the company, you know, not even for myself. I started it for anyone and everyone who ever goes through any sort of chronic illness to one, just be curious about other things that are out there that they can do to help themselves. And two, to give them something that they can enjoy, because I know that I had gone through so many years of not being able to have that and having to sacrifice one thing or another. And it's still, that is still a big, a big piece of it. And kind of using Toto as like a launch pad for future education for people, you know, just bringing that awareness to the surface. But now it has a completely new layer of meaning doing it with my soulmate and doing it with someone who we are building a life together. And I think that every decision we make together for the business and for ourselves personally feels like we're doing this out of a place of wanting to set the absolute best foundation. And I think that having someone to build with adds a completely new layer of meaning, depth, of joy, and and of purpose. You guys are just making me tear up like, <laughs> on, on, a, on a Friday afternoon. So that's, that's amazing. As I said, I can talk to you guys for so long, but I'm going to be <laughs> mindful of your time. So we're going to wrap up at this point. I would love to have a little giveaway for our listeners. So I'm going to 
Are you guys open to sharing your cookies with our bougie besties? 100%. That's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to invite everybody listening to go to Bougie Best Friend page, and I'm going to put like a little video recap of this episode. You're going to have to follow Toto's. You can follow Sydney and Bennett, and then just drop a comment and tell me what was your favorite part of this episode. Guys, this was so much fun, and <laughs> I am your biggest fan. Can you please share websites, your socials, where can people yes. buy the product? Yes. Our socials are Toto Foods Co. on Instagram, TikTok. You'll find both me and Bennett, both of our socials on both of those. And then where to buy, you can find us in any and all vitamin shop locations and micro markets around LA. So Lassen's, Mother's, Gelson's, Bristol Farms, Lazy Acres. Yep. Amazing. Well, thank you guys. And thank you everybody for listening to Bougie Best Friend Podcast. I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.